thanks for the introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm a PhD candidate at the Slice Lab at UC Berkeley. And this talk, I'll be going over some work I've been doing over the past year or so on implementation of this Saturn vector unit. All right, is that a little better? Yep. All right, great. Uh, so I just want to set the stage by going over what is the state of modern data level parallelism architectures and why you know, vector units exist in the first place and why we're trying to build a open source one uh, in the Slice Lab. Um, so broadly speaking, I've divided the uh, space of DLP architectures into four different deployment scenarios here, whether it's data center HPC, desktop consumer, specialized DSP cores, or your really lightweight embedded cores. And traditionally, the data center HPC space of data level parallel architectures have been dominated by uh, the classic vector supercomputers, and then more recently, these uh, big clusters of GPGPU, or essentially SIMT data parallel architectures. In the desktop consumer space, of course, uh, the space is predominantly dominated by uh, ARM and x86 implementations with uh, NEON or AVX SIMD extensions. And then as we move on to the specialized DSP core space, uh, in the commercial space, this area is dominated by things like uh, specialized VLIW ISAs with PACSIMD extensions. Uh, and of course, in the, you know, in this space of uh, you know, the wide range of different possible data parallel architectures, uh, RISC-5 Vectors offers this new promise of having a modern scalable vector ISA that is shared across all of these implement implementation design points and shared across all these deployment scenarios. This enables uh, binary compatible and performance portable code. But of course, RISC-V being an open ISA, it means that you know, the software development ecosystem around uh, these data parallel systems uh, should be much easier. So even with this, uh, you know, wanting to focus on these modern scalable vector ISAs, we notice that there's kind of a, uh, a lack of certain types of implementations in the open source space. Um, so we find that a lot of uh, existing academic work, uh, open source work in building up vector units tends to focus on the data center HPC or the desktop consumer space, right? They're trying to target the high end, build things that could aspire to eventually replace something like a GPU in some HPC cluster. On the other end, people are also looking at really low power, uh, area efficient vector units for uh, the embedded or low power space. Uh, and this is great as well, of course, this is a space where we need data level parallelism. But I think we've identified this missing niche where Saturn belongs, which is uh, vector units for DSP or specialized cores. So vector units for systems where uh, you're area constrained, you aren't as much concerned about the performance of general purpose code, but you still need high capability uh, compute throughput uh, and somewhat wide uh, vector data paths. So the goal of this Saturn vector unit is to uh, basically show how to design a efficient RVV implementation around a much more compact SIMD data paths uh, than the uh, uh, scientific computing or HPC style machines. And we'd also want to show that we can build a performant RVV implementation without relying on traditional uh, capabilities like having very long vector lengths or very deep temporal execution. We can show that we can build a very compact, efficient implementation that performs very well at vector code uh, without needing you know, many kilobits of storage for the vector register file. Uh, and finally, uh, I think we want to show that we can design an implementation that uh, achieves good performance on vector code without requiring the programmer to jump through hoops. I think it, you know, generally the vector compilers at this point aren't really that great at auto vectorizing your code, so you have to kind of get in the gritty details and, you know, you're often handwriting the assembly, hand vectorizing your loops, and it feels really bad when you spend all this work writing out this vector assembly, building up your very elegant loop, and you run it on your machine and you find that, oh, due to some microarchitectural or scheduling quirk of the machine, the performance isn't really what you expect. Uh, so with Saturn, we try to have an implementation that behaves predictably and is generally easy and straightforward to program for and to write performant code for. Uh, so just jumping straight into what we've built in Saturn. Saturn is this Chisel vector unit generator. Uh, so Chisel is a you know, HDL for uh, describing synthesizable RTL, uh, describing parameterized synthesizable RTL. So Saturn is essentially a Chisel program that um, is like 10,000 lines of Chisel. And then when you run the generator, you specify some configuration of the machine, some combination of data path width and vector length and you know, other parameters. And then it emits some uh, blob of synthesizable VLSI ready RTL that you can pass to your FPGA tools, your simulation tools, or even your uh, VLSI and tape out tools. So this vector unit is designed to integrate with existing lightweight RISC-V cores. So 
uh, some existing open source cores like Rocket or Shuttle. Uh, vector interfaces have been added to support the Saturn vector unit. Uh, this is, I believe, the first fully RVV compliant open source implementation. I think there's a lot of other implementations that are uh, getting close to this point, but I think this implementation in its current state supports the full set of the standard RVV 1.0 uh, requirements, including things like virtual memory, precise traps, uh, complex addressing modes like strided, indexed, or segmented loads and stores. And even beyond just base RVV, uh, Saturn already supports some uh, very useful vector extensions such as vector half precision floating point uh, or vector bit manipulation. Uh, like I said, Saturn is a highly uh, configurable generator, so we can configure many aspects of this machine ranging from uh, the data path width of the SIMD integer or floating point units, uh, the vector length, the length of the vector register files, uh, you know, the size of various issue queues, the uh, capability of the memory system. And the result of all these configuration knobs is that we can scale the design of the Saturn implementation all the way down to these ultra small, ultra lightweight vector units and all the way up to these you know, very capable high performance vector units that you might find doing something like video processing or even machine learning uh, in a modern SOC. Uh, so I wanna go over you know, briefly why we are focusing on maybe a different style of vector microarchitecture than a lot of existing academic systems. Uh, so I think a lot of existing vector microarchitectures can be broadly categorized as these long vector machines where they really derive their heritage from the microarchitecture of the original Cray vector supercomputers. Uh, and these machines, they're kind of organized around this notion of having independent lanes, vector lanes, where each lane contains some slice of the register file, uh, some set of ALUs for that lane, and then some independent memory port for that lane. And so this kind of design is really good when you're scaling up towards a very large number of lanes, right? You see on the diagram on the right, we can scale this machine up to you know, N, which can be like 8, 16, or 32 lanes. Uh, and so if you need a machine with very, very high capability uh, at data level parallelism, this is a reasonable uh, microarchitecture pattern to follow. And you know, the, uh, in executing vector code, these machines generally take advantage of deep temporal execution, which is they take their very long vector registers, you know, hundreds if not thousands of elements, and each single vector instruction is doing you know, 100 elements of work over uh, tens of cycles, right? So we can kind of unroll these instructions very aggressively in hardware, and the resulting implementation doesn't really need very high IPC to maintain good utilization of, uh, in this case, the memory and execute pipelines. So the challenges of this implementation are, uh, you are of course needing to dedicate a lot of storage to the implementation of the vector register file in the system. Uh, another consequence is that when you're scaling out your memory system across all these lanes, uh, it, it, it essentially requires a very high capability and very complex design uh, of your system level memory interface and your system level memory interconnect, uh, which can be challenging if you're building a more constrained, uh, area constrained system. If I'm building a system with only one or two lanes, it doesn't really make that much sense to use a microarchitecture that is designed to scale to 32 lanes, let's say. And so this is kind of a regime of vector architecture which Saturn is trying to uh, move away from. With Saturn, we're focusing on efficient vector execution with short vector length. So we're focusing on a regime where the uh, architectural vector length is around 2x the data path width. Uh, so for instance, if we build a machine where the data path width is 256 bits, our architectural vector length or each vector register is gonna be 512 bits wide. Uh, and this of course means that vector instructions will tend to execute in, you know, on the order of ones like two or four cycles instead of uh, 10 plus cycles. Uh, the other consequence is that the microarchitecture of these implementation is more similar to traditional SIMD data paths uh, than those very scalable long vector implementations. Uh, and so it's a bit more comparable to existing systems that people are deploying for uh, DSP cores. And you can see on the right, you know, in this pipeline visualization of some vector code running on a Saturn-like short vector machine, uh, we still have pretty good instruction throughput through the system. One IPC here, uh, but Saturn is able to, even though each vector instruction executes in much fewer cycles, uh, the Saturn microarchitecture is designed to be able to rather flexibly schedule around those instructions and perform some limited degree of out of order execution uh, in order to maximize utilization of all the data paths in the machine. Uh, and the other benefits of following this design pattern is that uh, the vector register file becomes less of a storage burden, it's, it's fewer bits to carry around in the machine, uh, and also that uh, a lot of applications which fundamentally don't have a very long vector length uh, will fit more naturally into the system where you're uh, hardware vector length is shorter. Uh, so going briefly into how Saturn supports full RVV, just another point of comparison. Um, a lot of existing vector units are designed either deeply integrated into the pipeline of an out-of-order core, uh, as is the top uh, pipeline diagram, 
Uh, or another pattern is you basically decouple the vector unit entirely and do everything related to vectors post commit uh, in a simpler core. So Saturn takes this hybrid approach where we do uh, this sort of bifurcated execution where ahead of the commit point of the core, we're doing uh, essentially pre-commit instruction validation where we're determining all the faults in the machine. We're doing early stage address translation, uh, cracking vector instructions that access multiple pages into single page accesses. Uh, and then once we validate these instructions don't trap, we can pass the uh, non-faulting instructions to the post-commit post instruction execution backend. And given all of those instructions are committed and will no longer misspeculate, uh, they can just execute down the machine and the, the backend scheduler can be a bit more efficient without having to deal with misspeculation. I uh, just want to briefly touch on, I think, a feature that's very cool in Saturn. Um, in the Visify Vector ISA, we have this, uh, these instructions for segment loads and stores, which are essentially doing, uh, you're loading a uh, struct of, uh, or a vector of structs and doing kind of a transpose of the fields of the structs. So for instance, if I'm loading complex numbers or RGBA values, I want you know, a vector of the reals and a vector of the imaginaries or a vector each for RGBNA. And with RVV, there's an instruction that allows you to do this in you know, a single instruction. Right? It's really nice for programmers to be able to kind of extract all the fields uh, in a single instruction. So in order to support this use case in Saturn, we've implemented this thing called a streaming segment buffer, which is kind of this generalized 2D microarchitectural structure that allows you to do these streaming transposes of data coming in from memory into your vector registers as it's doing the, the writebacks. Uh, so you can see on the left here, we're you know, loading these eight sets of structs. You're getting written into the segment buffer as columns. And then when we do the write back into the register file, we're pulling out the rows, right? So it's doing this streaming transpose that allows us to get good utilization of the memory system, even for these types of instructions. Uh, in terms of parameterization, like I mentioned, uh, we can support a, a wide range of implementations. So uh, on the top, you can see there's a, you know, example of a very compact implementation where we don't have very deep issue queues. We have a single vector issue unit for both integer and floating point. But you know, on the bottom design, if we start scaling up the number of issue queues, the number of uh, vector instruction sequencers, we can build a machine that, you know, in this case, is multi-issue across integer and flowing point. Uh, and other parameterization points, of course, is we support uh, configuring the vector length, anything from you know, 120 bit up, and the data path width from you know, anything from a 64 bit wide, rather narrow data path, all the way to an aggressive 512 bit wide machine. Uh, and then a bunch of the uh, options in the memory system can be adjusted as well. Uh, and the result is, uh, you know, if we draw up this Pareto curve of area and performance for different vector unit implementations, uh, we hope that Saturn can basically allow you to build design points across this entire frontier. So everything down from a uh, area minimal vector unit with very short vector lengths and a very compact data path, uh, and then scaling up all the features, the vector registers, the data path width, uh, all the way up until you get these DSP core-like or even uh, more general purpose designs that are going to have generally good performance on uh, any vector code. All right, thanks. Uh, so in terms of evaluation, uh, we, I, I don't have too many results right now because we're still awaiting a publication of most of these results. Uh, but I can show uh, a couple results on uh, matrix multiplication and floating point exponentiation comparing Saturn to uh, some other academic vector units. And I think what we generally see when looking across all these different kernels is that Saturn can achieve state-of-the-art performance or at least comparable performance to the existing vector units. In terms of frequency, we can achieve you know, the standard one gigahertz for an open source RTL design. Uh, and even compared to commercial systems, uh, I think a member of the community actually uh, took to benchmarking Saturn and comparing some of the results to uh, like the X60 and C908 commercial vector units, uh, Saturn can achieve comparable results as well. Uh, and so notably, I think Saturn can achieve good performance on these really small problem sizes, uh, which is an area where I think a lot of vector units uh, struggle with. Uh, so I, I don't have too many results here. The full results will hopefully be available in a publication form by the end of the year. Um, but for now, I think the QR code will give you a link to that website where there's some uh, comparisons of Saturn to uh, commercial vector units. Uh, so this is my last slide. Uh, Saturn is, of course, we built this and we're hoping to open source. Well, we did open source it and we're hoping that people can uh, use it as a tool to explore vector compute and the RISC-V vector ISA. Uh, it's currently all open source, available on GitHub. I'm calling this a 0 0.9 release for now as I'm you know, working through a lot of the details and doing more optimizations. It's openly licensed, and for using Saturn, it's directly integrated into Chipyard, so you can you know, clone this SOC generator framework and immediately start building configurations of various different vector units with different levels of compute capability and you know, doing comparisons, running your own code on those systems. So there's a lot of ongoing work, too. I'm, I'm also hoping to 
or I have written a lot of microarchitectural documentation of the system. I'm just awaiting uh, some technical feedback and uh, you know, that will be open sourced by the end of the year as well. And then we're trying to use Saturn to drive uh, education about vector units in, in the computer architecture classes at Berkeley. So we want to build things like pipeline visualization of vector instructions as they execute down the pipeline so students can understand what's going on in the system. Uh, and of course, we have some tape outs of Saturn as well. Um, so yeah, the, the repo is all available. All the code is there. Um, you know, more and more documentation will be filled in over the coming months. Um, if you're interested <laughs> in taking a look, I have the QR code right here. So thanks, everyone. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Jay. Do you have any other questions? Not yet. Not yet. Yes. There is actually one. <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, so how easy is it would be to share the arithmetic units with some, uh, which is normal out of order, RV64? Or would, would all the arithmetic units just be dedicated to the vector instructions? So are, are, you, are you talking about targeting like a efficient implementation yeah. where you're sharing? Yeah, area efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on the, on the bottom end, uh, I think in this uh, area minimal vector unit, we currently do support sharing at least a floating point unit, which is like a huge part of the area of, of these very efficient cores, uh, sharing that unit with the scalar core. For most of the other units like integer multiply, integer divide, uh, I think there's nothing like fundamentally blocking us from making that shared with the scalar core microarchitecture, uh, besides the fact that we, you know, at least I haven't taken the time to making that system work. It's something that could be explored in the future, but I uh, just haven't had the time to go into that area yet. All right. Yeah. Um, nice work, Jerry. Thank you very much for open sourcing this and doing the work. Um, I have a question about, so you, you kind of mentioned the deeply embedded class of like, yeah core is not something being targeted by this. Is it simply, could you just go and change DLender32 and integrate it and hope it would work or would, would there be issues there? I think that's kind of an open question I want to look at or have, uh, I think I'm working with some undergrads or master students who might want to look at this where I have some suspicion that, you know, like you said, if we just turn all the knobs all the way down and deploy this as like an embedded vector unit, how does it compare to the actual purpose-built designs? And I suspect there's probably a still a little bit of a gap there. I think some of the, like specifically the design of the vector register file doesn't necessarily scale that well to these ultra area minimal implementations. Uh, but if we could look at that and identify what that is and you know, be able to say something about it, I think that's a good next step for this project. Yeah, cool, yeah. thanks. Oh, yeah. uh, oh, was there another, somebody else? Oh, right. <laughs> uh, do, do you already have an, uh, yeah, an idea of, uh, let's say, Skywater, how fast is, uh, uh, Saturn will run? Uh, on Skywater, I don't because I think the, the problem we find is that um, in any tape out of, of these chisel based designs, usually the critical path goes through SRAMs. And I'm not like, I haven't checked in recently, but the last I heard, the SRAMs, uh, you know, timing library story of Skywater is still a little bit in flux. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been able to run any experiments in Skywater recently. Um, with like modern uh, commercial PDKs, we're we should be able to get around one gigahertz, and we, we have on uh, some of the recent tape belts. Okay, so what was the biggest challenge with getting the full compliance um, compared to also, I guess, other projects that didn't get the full compliance yet? What, do you, what makes you think, why, where are they lacking? I think the, the challenge is a lot of the, the, the barriers to, to full compliance, things like uh, precise traps with you know, strided, segmented, misaligned loads, they're required for full compliance, but they're perhaps not very interesting from an academic perspective. Uh, or like if, if you're building this vector unit, often like the, the problem you're interested in is how to exploit data level parallelism on these types of microarchitectures. And those barriers to full compliance aren't really related to that. It's kind of things that make the software developers' lives easier because they can you know, handle traps and faults and those kinds of things. But if you're you know, a applications engineer or you know, applications researcher and you just want to make your your kernel or your, your pipeline go really fast, you can just write your code to just ignore all those edge cases, right? And I think uh, like even, even in some of the earlier iterations of, those, of this design, I was considering you know, not going for full compliance and admitting a lot of those features as well. I think then the problem is I also didn't really want to spend that much time you know, hand writing software to work around all the non-compliant parts of the implementation. So it's like, okay, I just need to go in and like, you know, smash my head against the wall for a month and eventually figure out how to make the full compliance work. Um, but yeah, it's like all the edge cases with, you know, strided, segmented, 
index load stores, mass, and uh, you know, precise traps uh, make, a, make compliance difficult. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned there is a virtual memory support. Did you test it already with running Linux, for example? I have, but it's not. I haven't tested it regularly. I'm not. I'm not able to test it like regularly with every change. So this is why it's still like a 0 0.9 release. Is because I'm as I'm fixing like some performance bugs. Uh, I, I'm not like checking that it still boots Linux again on each bug. So I will do that when I try to push out the 1.0 release, which uh, maybe within the next week or two weeks or so. Yeah. Awesome. Let's thank the speaker okay. again. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs>